inaugurate the G20 as the fundamental financial group with a view to ultimately supplanting the G7, precisely because the balance of economic and financial power was, as you suggest, changing. On the other hand, I think there's been a certain amount of rather breathless commentary that doesn't fully reckon with the differences in, li in living standards between different parts of the world that suggests rather more continuing importance to the traditional leading parts of the world than a little bit of the tone of your question suggested. Question uh, for the lady in red. Um, Mr. Summers, my name is Rima Turk and I'm also from the IMF, uh, Middle East Center for Economics and Finance. Um, so it seems to me that countries throughout the world have um, are better able to use uh, some policy toolkit in terms of implementing sound microeconomic policies, uh, setting Europe aside in order to face the challenges uh, that we've been facing over the past uh, five years, and you put in that, out that in your discussion about the resilience of the U.S. economy in other parts of the world. But at the same time, what we've seen, and this is something that you've also touched upon, are two major challenges that we still need to be addressed. One of them is what you talked about, the growth inequality, and that the debt crisis is also a social crisis, and uh, how can we really like address the, um, the need to create jobs that do not lead to despair of, or political instability, but it's also a political crisis in terms of the political commitments that were made by various governments in terms of healthcare benefits, pension entitlements, and with the problems that these are leading in terms of intergenerational inequity. So, on the one hand, we've seen a better res resilience to crisis in most countries throughout the world, but we would not like to think that there is kind of a trade-off on the social and the political commitments that are made by various governments throughout the world. So to pick up on your last statement, that the challenge, these are challenging times, but um, these are also times of great opportunities. How do you see the path is in order to kind of make those three challenges converge and rather than to, to move away from the trade-off between the implementation of sound macroeconomic policies and meeting the social as well as the political commitments, how can we make all these ends meet? Thank you. I'm not sure you've asked a question that admits of the two or three minute answer, which is the most people are likely to want to hear uh, from me at this, uh, at this stage. Um, and it's a very thought it's a very thoughtful question uh, that you ask. I'd say two things. Uh, one is, remember, if we manage this right, there's the possibility for a lot of economic growth in the future. And the extra resources created by that economic growth are the resources that can be used to meet the various challenges that you describe. So one of the many reasons why, I don't side with those who would have us move away from maximizing growth, is that I think growth is important to managing debts while at the same time meeting our obligations to seniors, meeting our obligations to invest in the education of the children, and so forth. So growth creates the means, and experience suggests that growth tends to create the will for the kind of more generous and socially inclusive policies that your question made clear uh, that you favor. So part of it is it goes back uh, to growth. I think the other part of it is a more difficult part, and this is something that I don't think is fully accepted, and it varies from country to country. But the reality is that almost everywhere, there's gonna be a larger share of the population that's gonna be retired and government disproportionately takes, takes responsibility for the retired. Potentially there's going to be more inequality, which is going to mean there's going to be need to be more support uh, for the inclusiveness of prosperity coming from government. There are higher debt burdens, which means there's likely to be more interest coverage that is uh, necessary. And there are important changes and under-recognized changes in relative prices. The, uh, if you look at U.S. consumer price indices, 
they're normalized so that they're 100 in 1983. The price index for television sets is now six, as against 100 in 1960, 1983. The price, price index for a uh, university education or for a day in the hospital is about 600. So there's been a hundredfold change in relative price. Governments do more things that are like buying hospital care and university education than they do things that are like buying television sets. And so the relative price of the things that governments buy are rising. So I suspect that there's going to be pressure on the public sector to maintain its size or to expand in the years ahead. And the ability of the public sector to do that is going to depend on the creation of effective and viable tax systems and effective and viable tax systems that can raise revenue from everyone. And there's going to be a real challenge and a real problem globally if um, those who are most fortunate are also best able to escape taxation by pitting jurisdiction against jurisdiction. And so my hope would be that we'll see increased cooperation globally to develop effective tax systems and that will prevent some of the capital mobility that's driven not by opportunity but, sim but simply by uh, tax uh, evasion. Uh, one of America's greatest Supreme Court justices, Oliver Wendell Holmes, uh, famously said, taxes are what we pay for civilization. And I think it's a very important uh, point. And I think developing strong tax institutions and closely related, developing international cooperation uh, in the tax area, and you've seen some progress uh, in it, is going to be an important imperative in the years ahead if the balance you strike is to be, you want to strike, is to be achieved. I think we'll take a couple more questions because of time schedule. Uh, Professor, I have two small questions. The first one, uh, what are the benefits, or is there any benefit to develop an integrated financial market for the GCC region? I'm sorry. I uh, is what are the advantages or the benefits to get an integrated only financial markets for all the GCC region? And the second question, one question. are there benefits? We have one, one more question. Yeah, it's linked um, okay. to, uh, to have a single currency for the region. I'm not, I'm not enough of an expert on the uh, GCC situation to prescribe for you with any confidence. It does seem to me that whatever one thought about monetary unions five years ago, the experience in Europe over the last five years should induce greater caution and should make one more aware of the risks than one was before. That doesn't mean it might or might not be a good idea, but it's probably an idea that, looks, that should look more complicated today uh, than it did uh, five years ago. I think there are obviously benefits to uh, financial uh, integration. Of course, it's the logic of economics that trade brings the greatest benefit when people are bringing very different things to the table than when they're bringing very similar things to the table. And so I'm not sure that integration within the GCC, where the countries obviously have important differences, but also have important similarities in their basic economic position, is quite as important as the way the GCC relates to the broader global uh, economy. This gentleman. 
That's quick. Good morning, Professor. My name is Nicholas Gilani, National Bank of Abu Dhabi. Uh, you mentioned the good old uh, justice who said that taxes are way for pay for civilization. I see. A, I know a lot of Europeans who are very civilized who are coming to the GCC to to have their, their vote. Looks like taxes in Europe are taking a big chunk of people's income. But having said that, let's talk about shale oil and shale gas. I just read in the paper that uh, the United States has given one export license to Chesapeake to export gas to countries such as Korea and. Uh, Japan and there are 25 to 30 more licenses to be issued, waiting. How would that change the geopolitical factor in the Middle East where, for example, Qatar exports gas on long-term contracts and the United States producer would be able to undercut Qatar by selling spot prices of gas? Thank you. Look, uh, if the United States is able to export gas in large quantity, that gas would obviously be a source of competition for other exporters of uh, gas and would tend to drive through arbitrage towards more equality of prices than exists in the world uh, today. I think it's important to recognize, as you, as you did in your question, that there's only one license, if that, that has been approved, that there are very long lags in approval, in environmental review, in implementation, in construction. So I think we are a very long way from the day when there will be so much natural gas exported from the United States that it will be a major factor affecting the global price uh, of uh, natural gas in the other major industrial in the other major industrial countries. But you're right about where it will go uh, in the very long run. But I suspect um, that the process of environmental review, construction, and implementation um, will be so long that I'm not sure that's, I, I suspect there will be three or four major surprises and developments in the global energy markets that will happen between now and whenever the moment is when the U.S. emerges as a large natural gas exporter. And if the U.S. emerged as a large gas exporter within a decade, large enough to have a major effect on the global market, I would be a little bit surprised. Ashab Saada, Saada was Sayyid al Fawal. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to express our appreciation to our honorable guest speaker, Secretary Summers, for holding the distance, taking the time and effort to share his deep views and shedding the light over the economic recovery in the US and across. We wish him a safe trip back home with the hope to see him in future occasions. Our thanks also to Mr. Alberto Vermi, Mr. Zbayd Ahmed, Mr. Oscar Gutkai, and Mr. Nadim Saleh, and others from Citigroup, who worked hard and teamed with our department to arrange this gathering. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, your presence has been the essence of this event. Thank you for attending, and please accept our luncheon invitation at the Jason Hall. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.